Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name is Adam Jones and I, on behalf of Sustainable Buildings Canada, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this month's uh, webinar on adapting to irreversible extreme heat. Um, so here's a quick agenda of uh, what we're going to be doing today. Here we are right now in the welcome and introduction. Um, just a, a short overview of what's coming up for Sustainable Buildings Canada in the next little while. And then we will go to our main presentation on irreversible extreme heat. Um, and then, so that'll be about 50 minutes. And then we'll have a, a 30 minute period for questions from the audience. So um, as Always, anyone who's been on one of our webinars knows uh, if you go into the question pane on the GoToWebinar applet there, you can type in a question at any time and I'll call on you um, during the Q&A period. Or you can send an email to me right there, adamjones at sbcanada.org. And then also during the question period, um, you can just raise your hand. So there's a little virtual hand you can raise and I will call on you to open up your microphone and um, ask your question directly. Um, so first things first, let me tell you about the Green Building Festival. Um, as you know, anyone who's tuned into what we've been doing, we launched it uh, last month. Um, the theme for this year is positive. Um, so we're, you know, there's a lot of sort of bad news. This this might be one of the, the presentations about sort of the, the bad side of climate change. What are we seeing that's going to be happening? And so Green Building Festival theme this year is positive. What are things that we can do to maintain positive outcomes? Um, in the building industry, um, adapting to the rapidly changing climate and to everything else in the world that's rapidly changing. So you can register for the Green Building Festival at gbf22.com or as always at sbcanada.org, you can get a link. Um, also, we have launched the new branding for Sustainable Buildings Canada. So you'll see on the left there, our, our new logo, um, it's uh, still the, the sort of the, the same great content, just a slightly new look. So if you go to our website, it's sort of redesigned um, with it a little bit easier to find resources. We've got a lot of resources for um, designers, planners, um, regulators, uh, anyone in the building industry who's looking for ways to make their buildings more energy efficient. Um, we have a lot of resources for new construction buildings and a lot of resources for existing buildings. Uh, we've tried to take a really strong position on this, um, um, helping people improve uh, performance of existing buildings because that represents the vast majority of the buildings that will exist for the next hundred years are buildings that are already built. So if you go to sbcanada.org slash resources or slash papers, then you'll be able to see uh, some of the resources there. And uh, there's also a lot of energy modeling guidelines for the Savings by Design program and um, to help people understand uh, what the uh, climate in Toronto in particular, but across Canada, what it's going to be doing um, in the next 50 years and how to um, prepare your buildings for it by modeling that um, environmental condition out. We also have some upcoming webinars. We're still working at the details, so um, we'll be sure to check sbcanada.org for updates. But uh, we're working on um, a product knowledge webinar with SolarWall, the transpired solar thermal collector, um, a regulatory review webinar with uh, the Toronto Green Standard team about the changes of version four, which recently launched, and then uh, the update to the savings by design program, um, which has just recently been approved by the OED. Uh, so uh, some small changes to the program. Um, and so if you check with us, anyone on the mailing list will get an update, um, but uh, keep checking back with us and we'll have dates on those pretty soon. All right, well, that's all from me about uh, Sustainable Things Canada's updates. Um, I'm going to hand things over to our presenter today, Joanna Akem, the uh, Managing Director Climate Resilient Infrastructure at the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation at the University of Waterloo. And I'd just like to say um, this, we talked a lot about this, uh, how insurance companies have been pushing a lot of the, um, the effects of climate change onto the agenda of uh, regulators. And this is yet another example where um, something that probably wasn't being considered in the building industry, um, aside from some very niche spots, particularly Passive House, uh, and the, but the new Toronto Green Standard also looking at 72 hours of um, 
thermal uh, continuity, let's call it, um, thermal safety. Um, and now we can see intact uh, uh, pushing through this, the intact center and climate adaptation on yet another aspect of climate change. So um, I'd like to welcome Joanna Akem. Uh, Joanna, uh, welcome. I'm gonna give you screen sharing control so you can get started on your presentation. Perfect, thank you so much, there. Adam. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. So hopefully you can, right. sit, you can see that. Perfect. Excellent, good. So yeah, so as Adam said, I'm the Managing Director of Climate Resilient Infrastructure here at the Intech Center on Climate Adaptation. We're a research, applied research center attached to the University of Waterloo. Um, so I'm not an employment of Intech, so don't ask me any insurance questions, please. Uh, apart from the ones I might be aware of because we do work with insurers, but I am not an insurer. So, um, so just to make that difference because often that confuses people. So yeah, so we are a, a research center based at the University of Waterloo concerned with preparing for climate risks and reducing climate risk by working with residents, businesses, the financial sector and governments. So uh, we have a lot of practical resources. Um, uh, and one of those resources is basically a new national guidance on preparing for extreme heat, which we released in April. So I'm here primarily to talk to you about that, but I'll also try and give a little flavor of some of the other things that we have uh, to offer. Okay, so, so for the agenda for the webinar, I'm gonna firstly talk about why we need to adapt to extreme heat. I think possibly, possibly since summer 2021, we're all a little bit more convinced that this is a serious issue. So um, but I want to give you some of the background of what is coming. Um, so an overview of predictions of extreme heat for Canada. And then the majority of the presentation, I do want to focus on actions to reduce risk because we're very much trying to talk about the solutions. And I kind of calling back to the positivity um, theme that Adam introduced, a lot of the actions I will present actually have win-win benefits as well. So um, I'll be stressing those. Uh, so achieving multiple benefits is very much part of the presentation. Um, I just mentioned at the outset, so a lot of the details I'm going to talk about are in the new guidance document at Versible Extreme Heat Protecting Canadians and Communities from a Lethal Future. Um, so that is freely available on our website and uh, we are aiming to share it with um, as many people as possible. So if you find it useful, please do share it with your uh, colleagues. Um, and the presentation will also be provided to you too. So, um, and if you have any questions, I will be very happy to have an interactive discussion um, I'm hoping for, because um, otherwise these webinars get very boring. So, <laughs> so hopefully everyone will have lots of questions. So to start at the beginning, uh, climate change is real. And now I, I'm not sure um, kind of from, from your perspective, but I've been convinced of this from for a while. And I think reading the sixth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change basically was not saying that much different to the fifth assessment report, just saying the same thing in more urgent language. Um, so we, it's unequivocal that, uh, unequivocal that um, human influences warm the atmosphere, ocean and land. We are seeing rapid changes already. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't want to be the doom and gloom person, um, but I just, I do check back on NOAA's kind of state of the climate summary. Um, they provide a monthly summary and a, annual kind of wrap up. Um, and this slide basically shows all the different kind of extreme weather events and highlights um, that the Western Canada heat dome uh, in, in where we set a, a new national maximum temperature, you know, was, a, was an event of a, on a global scale, obviously. And I think, um, you know, we've seen since, sadly, since 2021, we've already seen this year events in, 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 in India, uh, at the moment in France and Spain, um, uh, in the, the United States. So I think this is something that we are gonna see more frequently and more severely, unfortunately, as time goes by. So um, in terms of the Canadian context, so Canada's climate has already warmed and will warm further in the future. Uh, and this is the conclusions from the 2019 report, Canada's Changing Climate, which is produced by the federal government. Uh, both past and future warming is about 
or on average about double the magnitude of global warming and warming is effectively irreversible. And what that means is on what we consider as kind of human timescales, we're not gonna be able to reverse uh, climate change. And actually some of the changes like sea level rise are baked in now for uh, kind of centuries to millennia. Um, so we're going to have to adapt to those changes. Um, so in terms of the changes that we're anticipating, uh, in terms of those kind of ongoing climate change, so more extreme heat, less extreme cold, shorter seasonal coverage of snow and ice, melting glaciers and permafrost and rising in sea levels. But then particularly of importance for this presentation is the intensification of extremes. So often when we talk about extremes in Canada, we're often talking about flooding or wildfire, um, but Severe heat waves is one of those extremes that's going to be getting more intense and more frequent into the future too. So um, I'm, you know, I think to date we haven't paid as much attention to this, but we will need to pay attention to it going forward. I've called this slide, this is not just an environmental issue uh, because often climate change and climate adaptation gets bumped into the environmental box. Um, so this is not an environmental issue. This is actually an economic issue and a very much a social issue. So um, we mentioned the insurance industry. Um, so the graph on the top at the top of this slide is basically the insured catastrophic losses. So catastrophic event is over $25 million in losses. So you can see, um, well, we probably can't see because maybe the font's a bit small, but um, we're a, around $2 billion in insured losses at the moment in in Canada in the last few years. Um, the, the fact is that most losses are not actually insured. So for each dollar of insured loss, there's actually about three to four dollars that we're seeing in uninsured losses, which are incurred by governments, businesses, and individuals. So, um, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg on the whole fin financial side of things. And then I kind of, uh, this, this kind of, um, this table actually kind of brought it home to me that, you know, insurance companies are also looking at heat waves and not necessarily in terms of the financial losses that they have you know in this column the heat wave in Canada does not have a assigned economic loss associated with it but they've included an estimated 800 lives lost for the whole the western Canada heat wave um, so insurance companies are definitely looking at these kind of events and not all catastrophic losses are felt in financial terms, but very much obviously that, you know, those people have died and those lives are important socially. Um, so that's just a fairly, so that's the doom and gloom part of it. Um, uh, so in terms of health as well, we're seeing much more involvement of the health community in climate change and the kind of, um, you know, realizing the impacts of climate change as a health issue. Um, so obviously one of the obvious is heat actually, rising temperatures and extreme heat is negatively impacting our health, uh, obviously, but also wildfires and expansion of zoonotic diseases, for example. Um, so there's actually quite a lot more research and guidance on um, how we can manage the health of Canadians in a changing climate. And a realization that these health impacts actually do have a cost. Um, so there was a, a report from the Canadian Climate Institute on the health costs of climate change and actually heat related deaths and heat related productivity losses were some of the you know the losses that they actually quantified in financial terms looking at something like 8.5 billion dollars by the end of the century if we kind of head on a high emission scenario or 5 billion um, if we head on a more kind of low emission scenario. So um, obviously these costs are significant. If we, we you know we talked about $2 billion of catastrophic loss, insured loss, so $8 billion, you know, a fairly significant amount associated with potential heat related deaths. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the other ones, but I think hopefully I've made the point that it's not just an environmental factor. Um, just to stress that even more and from a more uh, a nature side as well. So, um, so the World Economic Forum, actually uh, extreme weather was the top short-term global risk in the global risk report that they produced for this year. 
Um, but you probably those who were listening around JAVOS 2022, that there was actually a lot of focus on nature positive um, economy, economic action. And preceding that in 2020, the, the World Economic Forum's report on the new nature economy, um, you know, this an oft quoted fact or um, kind of estimation. So basically $44 trillion of economic value generation, which is over the half of the world's total GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature. So um, there is an environmental kind of side of this, but we, we are, you know, we have the dual crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss to face. And I will be focusing on in my presentation on actions on some of the actions that actually help with both of those elements. So um, I want to stress kind of the importance of track tackling climate change on both fronts. So in Canada, we have actually um, spent quite a lot more time focusing on mitigation and reducing greenhouse gases than we have on adaptation. Um, we have a emissions reduction plan that was issued uh, earlier this year. And basically we are working on a national adaptation strategy and we really need to kind of in invest more time and attention in adaptation in Canada to reduce the impacts of climate change. Uh, and the difference between the two of them is that, so adaptation is to manage the impacts and mitigation is to avoid the impacts. So we can think of adaptation as managing the unavoidable. So the effects of emissions that we cannot reverse and then mitigation is avoiding the unmanageable in the long term, slowing down climate change. But in, while we're doing that, we still have to cope with the impacts. So it's not really a choice between these two strategies. We must do both and we must do both in parallel. And um, we are trying to stress the urgency of adapting uh, to avoid kind of disasters and more people dying and more people you know, being adversely affected by climate change in the future. Um, one other thing that, that's a positive is uh, physical infrastructure is actually um, kind of highlighted by the Council of Canadian Academies in their report in 2019 as, you know, one of the key consequences and likelihood of, of things that, you know, a risk, because risk is, is likelihood and consequence combined. So you can see this little blue square, they, they looked at different aspects of the economy. And this little blue square represents physical infrastructure. So which buildings is part of that. But it's also um, one of the biggest potentials for adaptation. So, um, you know, that's why we actually spend quite a lot of time talking about physical infrastructure. Um, and that's built infrastructure and natural infrastructure, because we actually use natural infrastructure as well. So, um, so yeah, so that's a, a big potential to help us adapt. And I also present climate adaptation, adaptation as risk management. So um, some people might recognize this flow chart. It's from the uh, ISO 31000 risk management guidelines. Uh, so this is the process of how we identify risks, evaluate them, and then treat them, and then kind of monitor how we're doing. Um, so that is what climate adaptation is, which we're trying to treat the risks of climate change so that we, um, you know, we reduce the 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 adverse of impacts that we feel of climate change. Um, and building designers have a key role to play in that. So it can help in understanding net changing natural hazards, understanding the more kind of gradual climate changes and sea level rise, assessing climate risks to buildings and communities, reducing the risks through risk treatment. So that means retrofitting existing infrastructure as well as designing more sustainable infrastructure for the future um, that takes into account future climatic conditions, as well as influencing behavior of others to reduce risk also. So the Intech Center on Climate Adaptation comes into this at the risk treatment um, kind of side of things. So we, as I said, we're a applied research center on climate adaptation with a national focus. So we are based at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I'm actually based in Montreal, so um, because we also deal in everything is bilingual from our center so we also talk in French. Um, we have two main goals and one of those is as you've probably gathered by the presentation today is to make sure that the national conversation about climate change addresses climate adaptation 
and to also provide practical actions or solutions to help residents, communities, businesses, financial sector to reduce risk on the ground. So we have identified um, kind of three perils or hazards where we are working actively and those are flooding, wildfire and extreme heat. Um, flooding also includes an aspect of erosion, particularly at the coast. Um, and then I've called them capitals or kind of this is, you know, it affects because climate change affects each of these. So we also look at ways we can work with nature, with finance and with health to help reduce risks from these perils. So those are kind of the key areas of our work. Um, and then just to give you a kind of a snapshot of what I'm going to present as part of our suite of tools. So you can see the, uh, the extreme heat report at the bottom, but we have a whole range of resources uh, available for looking at flood risk, uh, also coastal protection, wildfire, using natural infrastructure, and also reporting under TCFD on the physical risk side. So. Um, I think you'll get this presentation that's like a little mini library, so you can click on any of these. So back to extreme heat. Um, so essentially urban areas are the hot spots of global warming. And this is a, a figure that's adapted from the IPCC report. Um, so you can see that um, the way we've kind of designed our cities, often we have geometry that's kind of dense and the city layout might actually reduce kind of air movement. We have heat from human activity itself, but also importantly, heat retaining properties of our buildings and road materials. So we kind of, um, all these aspects add to warming specifically in our cities. And we're often lacking things like vegetation and trees or, or water. So basically, um, it's kind of a, a double whammy because we, we have lots of kind of artificial surfaces and not so much natural natural surfaces in our cities. So often our cities are significantly warmer than the surrounding areas, which we call a urban heat island. And this was identified as a key national issue for Canadian cities and towns. Uh, and just to give you a, an idea of some of the differences, uh, nighttime temperatures in cities can be up to 12 degrees hotter than surrounding areas. And you might look at surface day temperatures 10 to 15 degrees hotter in cities. So, um, so and it affects air and surface temperatures, um, but um, around one in seven Canadians actually lives in one of our 35 metropolitan areas. So you can see that if it's really affecting cities, um, then that's actually quite a significant portion of Canadian, Canadians in our country. In terms of the impacts of heat on health and beyond, obviously, uh, when we think of extreme heat, we often think of impacts on our physical health and potential fatalities. I have uh, updated the slides since we received the, the uh, British Columbia coroner's report, um, which estimated, uh, well, it reported that 619 people unfortunately lost their lives due to the heat dome um, in last summer. Uh, obviously, these physical impacts are, are fairly kind of what we often focus on, but there's often in other impacts. So for example, on our mental health, like heat can have a strong kind of um, impact on people's mood. People are often very more irritable and can actually be, be more violent uh, during extreme heat events. And, and obviously we are uncomfortable and it can affect our productivity. But beyond people, we extreme heat can also impact on infrastructure. So including the electrical power grid, uh, digital and communications, transport. So for example, rail, um, we can actually get rail defects from extreme heat. Roads can uh, bleed and rut and kind of, you know, effectively melt. Um, waste water, water and wastewater and, and buildings are adversely affected by extreme heat. Uh, also systems such as our health and social systems are obviously put under a significant strain in extreme heat events, but also our food systems and natural systems. For example, in BC, we saw a significant impact on shellfish um, because, you know, they're vulnerable they're, when they're left out or the tide goes, goes out, they're left on the shore baking, essentially. So extreme heat impacts widely in our communities. Um, but not everybody is at the same risk. So um, extreme heat is also a kind of ex exacerbates existing inequality. 
So uh, people who are more exposed to extreme heat, for example, people who are obviously in urban heat island areas, also people who are living in housing that is poorly adapted to extreme heat, for example, on higher floors of apartment buildings, or that are poorly insulated or poorly, like don't have uh, adequate ventilation. Uh, people who work outdoors also very much more exposed. Um, people who are socially isolated as well, that's an important one because that's often, um, you know, people are more exposed because they're indoors all the time, but they're also not being checked on. So those are often people that we, we find it's too late um, before we actually realize there was a problem. Uh, people who might be physiologically more sensitive, so this includes the elderly, people with chronic diseases, for example, um, people aren't taking certain medications. Uh, and then other people may have also less resources. So um, if you're on a lower income or you're experiencing homelessness or you're living in an underserved community, um, then you may be, have less available to help you cope with extreme heat. So in terms of the projections for Canada, uh, we looked at three different indicators of extreme heat but using the Climate Atlas, um, which is available data to everybody. and I would recommend you, you have a look at it if you haven't already. It's fairly user-friendly um, and gives a, a broad indication in a user-friendly way of various different, different indicators of climate, climate change. So we looked at the annual number of do, uh, days over 30 degrees, the maximum high temp, warmest maximum temperature for the year and the length, average length of heat waves. So, um, you can see the, the maps, uh, basically um, there's three areas which we highlighted that were more exposed to extreme heat. So that being the valleys between the West Coast and Rocky Mountains, uh, prairie communities along the US uh, border, and then around the Great Lakes and down the St. Lawrence River Valley. And these are areas kind of clustered against our Southern border. And um, unfortunately, these are the areas where many of our cities are located. So the area of exposition to this risk actually coincides with where we are concentrated in terms of our population. We also looked for these, at these three different indicators at um, ranking our metropolitan areas. So based on census metropolitan areas, looking at just where, very simply, where, where are the top 10? Um, and we noticed that some communities, for example, come up repeatedly like Kelowna, uh, for example, figures pretty highly for each of these indicators. But we also have, uh, for example, many of you I think might be around in Toronto. So um, Toronto is actually number 10 in the ranking of maximum temperature. You can see the temperature here is estimated to go from something from like 33 as a maximum annual temperature to something like 38. Uh, so a, an extra four degrees um, or so on top of the, uh, the highest temperature that you'll be experiencing in the year. Um, also areas, uh, such as Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto. So many of our big cities feature in these top 10 rankings, um, which is obviously a concern. This map kind of brings together that information. So based on that ranking um, exercise, we basically show on here the, the, the metropolitan areas that were kind of highlighted as most exposed to extreme heat. This doesn't include for the urban heat island effect. So, um, so that would be on top. So obviously it could be significant. And um, we also give some examples of some smaller communities that are similarly exposed. And the red circles represent the size of population within those cities. So you can see that obviously, you know, Toronto is this big circle here and Montreal is here. Um, so actually uh, these, um, metropolitan areas account for about 17, more than 17 million uh, people. So a significant number of, amount of our population living in areas potentially exposed to extreme heat. So now I'm, that's the kind of less positive side. I'm now going to move on to the actions to, uh, to reduce risk, which is, uh, you know, the most important thing. Because, uh, you know, once we know the risk, we need to know what to do about it. So in our um, report, we have divided the actions into three kind of types of uh, groups. 
So we've looked at actions for individuals, for property owners and managers and communities, and then three types of action. So uh, non-structural or behavioral change. Um, so things that are not built, but more plans and how we interact with each other. Uh, green infrastructure, how we work with nature and gray infrastructure, which is uh, you know, how we improve our buildings and public infrastructure. So those are signposted throughout the report. So in terms of for individuals, um, you know, there's the things that we can all do, I think is one of our messages in the report uh, around our own homes to think about how we can uh, reduce the risk of extreme heat. Um, so some of these things are more on the social side, which are, you know, making sure that we identify uh, friends and family who are living on their own, for example, and that we have a plan to check on them during a heat wave and that we are helping them to prepare in the same way that we are preparing. Um, receiving heat warnings, learning how to use natural ventilation and how our houses work, because, um, you know, I know many of us have like a system of when it's hot in the day, which windows we open, which blinds we close, etc., to try and minimize uh, heat gain in the house. Um, looking at reducing indoor heat production by switching off unused appliances, for example, or working in the basement, even if we have a cool room that's naturally cooler than, you know, moving our lives around to take advantage of that. Um, but then the more structural actions, we can also uh, look at maintaining and you know, maybe even planting trees near our house to shade our houses, uh, expanding vegetation cover in our gardens, on our balconies, um, installing uh, green roofs is a kind of a more um, kind of involved process that we obviously need a contractor to help you with. Uh, growing a green facade, though, can be uh, an easier kind of action working with nature at the home level. Uh, and then getting into some of the actions that are more probably what um, this audience is used to talking about, uh, enhancing insulation, um, like using reflective surfaces on our buildings, using thermal mass within our buildings, installing windows that reduce heat gain, uh, shading devices ideally outside, but if not inside. Um, and like temperature monitors and controls to make sure if we are using active cooling measures that they're using them um, if efficiently. Um, active cooling does feature in this. So we have, um, we have fans, which are, um, you know, with it's in certain conditions are, are useful. Uh, and then looking at active cooling through heat pumps, ideally. Because um, uh, you know, making sure if we are using active cooling, it is energy efficient. But we're trying to convey the message that there's all these like passive cooling measures that even if you are going to use active cooling, um, you know, we need to use it sparingly. So um, even if we are doing that, we need to put in passive measures too. So in terms of the win-wins. Um, so obviously, we, if we put in these kind of measures, the idea is that we have improved comfort, well-being and mental health, as well as kind of less risk to physical health, we can get lower energy bills. For example, if we're enhancing insulation, this is actually good from a heating perspective, as well as from a cooling perspective. Um, we can also improve productivity if we're working at home, which many of us are doing still. Um, can also help enhance property value. For example, if we have mature trees, um, that can actually add to our property value. And stronger social networks and relationships, because actually one of the kind of, you know, indicators of uh, vulnerability is this kind of social isolation. But, you know, social networks and relationships can just help make our lives better as well from so many more perspectives as well. So, um, so those are extra advantages at the individual scale. So now on to the property owner and management, which is probably where most of this audience is more interested. Uh, so obviously multi-unit residential buildings can have many more challenges. Um, we're often dealing with older infrastructure that has not been designed with extreme heat in mind. We can have higher temperatures on higher floors because of the increased solar radiation. Uh, it can be limited opportunity for natural ventilation. Often windows do not open or because of the pressure um, which I, was something I learned when I was writing this report is like because they're pressurized hallways if you you can't just open the window and circulate the air that just doesn't work like that 
Um, we also have a reliance on power supply to elevate operate elevators, provide air conditioning and pump water to higher floors. So um, there's a vulnerability if the power goes out. I know Adam mentioned about the 72 hour um, kind of backup power supply in, in Toronto. So that's an important consideration because extreme heat is not classed as an emergency at present. And we may have vulnerable residents who uh, you know, are renting, do, do not own their building, have like less resources to help them prepare for extreme heat. Uh, in addition, commercial buildings may have additional vulnerabilities such as specific heat sensitive equipment, you might think of freezers or fridges, uh, reliance on power supply obviously to run the HVAC system, and often large unexposed parking lots that really, really can um, contribute to the urban heat light island effect. So those are particular uh, points of, of action. Uh, so in terms of property owners and managers, of, um, in similar way to uh, individuals, we need to be aware of what the vulnerabilities are in our buildings and also whether we have tenants uh, who are particularly vulnerable and need additional help and how we are going to help those people. For example, if there is a cool room that they can shelter in during extreme heat events uh, because not everyone has access to air conditioning. Um, similarly, in, uh, to individuals, there's also opportunity to use green infrastructure. You can see a little diagram here. It's actually a, um, a parking lot applying. Uh, there's a Quebec standard for parking lot design to actually deal with stormwater and uh, heat island effects. So using vegetation and drainage um, to kind of help, um, you know, tackle those two at the same time. So that's uh, you know one thing that I would recommend you looking at if you're not familiar with that. Um, green roofs and green walls, which we've already talked about. And then in addition to the other uh, building uh, gray infrastructure solutions, considering backup power generation uh, being particularly important. Um, so having, as we said, 72 hours maybe of extended um, air condition, uh, um, energy, production so we can provide cool rooms to residents and kind of keep um, things going for longer than I think according to the building code is I think two hours so that you can evacuate a building but you know that's not long enough if people are in an extended heat wave and they have nowhere to go um, and then looking at arranging for backup water supply as well can also be important at the building level. Just an example of uh, in Toronto, they have their rent safe um, um, kind of system. So they already have requirements for landlords to look at uh, providing cooling rooms and also notification to their residents of where the cooling room is located. Um, so, you know, this is already factoring into property owner responsibilities. And then looking at on the green infrastructure side, um, you know, we have uh, you can see the green roofs are in here. So this, the green infrastructure and kind of if we're using naturalized spaces in, around parking lots can actually be part of a blue green network in uh, in the community. And this, you know, every little helps in this terminology. I'm just going to show you a. So this is where I li I live on Nuns Island in um, in Montreal, and on the actual island, we are very lucky to have. Uh, you know, kind of green infrastructure on our streets and around uh, a lot, many of our commercial buildings and larger residential buildings. Uh, whereas in the opposite uh, bank is Verdun, where it's more, uh, it's an older development and natural infrastructure was not embedded in urban design uh, to the same extent. And you can see the difference that it has on surface temperatures. So, um, you know, this, the, the, um, wider benefits of property level action do add up in terms of natural infrastructure. Extra advantages for uh, property owners and managers, they can provide better experiences for tenants, possibly lower operating costs if they're cooling their buildings without um, as much use of uh, air conditioning or active cooling. Uh, there's a greater chance of avoiding business interruptions or, or, and having an enhanced reputation. Um, they can actually also improve their performance in terms of environmental, social and governance criteria, which is a big um, boom in the sustainable finance world. Um, and then 
additional foot traffic in pedestrian retail environments may be important to commercial building owners and raising property values and rent premiums with lower vacancy rates if the tenant has a better experience, for example. So those can be additional advantages. At the community level, it's kind of a, a bit the same, but just at a, a larger scale. So, um, you know, there's a whole element of identifying vulnerable people in advance and how we are going to specifically help those people during extreme heat waves in terms of emergency planning. Um, but in terms of green infrastructure, the opportunity is really to provide a blue green network throughout the city and actively increase tree canopy. And I know places are uh, very much investing in managing their trees as assets to the to the city. So um, you know that's all um, in the right direction. In terms of grey infrastructure, the elements we haven't maybe talked about so far is incorporating active transport and kind of trying to reduce vehicular traffic, because uh, obviously cars produce more heat in, in the city, so that contributes to the urban heat island effect. Um, looking at adapting uh, public infrastructure to extreme heat, such as our transportation, et cetera, that's a key element. Uh, using cool pavements is another thing that has been um, you know, kind of, I think the LA streets, um, we're particularly looking at that. Uh, and you can actually also provide artificial shade. Uh, um, you know, if we can't provide trees, maybe that we can also, we can provide artificial shade to shelter people uh, from the sun as well. Uh, just like to stress that natural infrastructure reduces extreme heat and more. So, um, so there's actually, you know, multiple benefits from working with uh, with natural infrastructure, trees and vegetation, from the kind of the lot level to the city level, because um, you know it helps us tackle the urban heat island effect. It also delivers significant other benefits. Uh, for example. Uh, it can help us with stormwater management, it improves air quality with associated health benefits. Um, obviously, a lot of cities are working towards uh, net zero targets, so carbon sequestration and storage is also being monitored, um, local habitat and biodiversity, and opportunities for recreation and active transportation. So. I um, actually did a presentation at the Canadian Water Resources Association and you know a lot of these uh, green infrastructure methods are called low impact development but actually can actually have a very much a positive impact by working with or mimicking natural processes and delivering ecosystem services which is what this wheel of service is. Um, just to stress, as they're at the end of the report, uh, looking at the different actions to tackle extreme heat, there is a table that tries to summarize some of the co-benefits. Uh, so, um, and actually, it's very evident that working with nature achieves the most additional benefits. Um, but you know, other actions also have uh, additional benefits, particularly for energy efficiency, which probably ties in nicely with some of the focus areas of your group. Um, again, it's not a, just an environmental issue, so actually increasing our natural capital, I just kind of stress the point that our human capital, so our society and produced capital, which is probably what we traditionally think of as the economy, and actually all of this is the economy, so um, we actually depend on natural capital for, for as part of our economy, so um, yeah, so natural infrastructure is not just important for nature, but it's important for us because we are part of nature. <laughs> um, and how do sustainable building designers fit into all this? Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people have a role in assessing extreme heat risks for new and existing buildings. So when looking at retrofits, there's tools available for that. Um, one of them is the um, PIVC protocol, for example, uh, but you have a, a lot of other tools. I know um, like heat modeling and energy modeling is very much uh, advancing rapidly. Um, reducing extreme heat risks through adaptation planning and design. Um, and I'd like to stress the importance of considering the whole property. So um, obviously there's the buildings, but the, the, how we deal with their grounds is really important for urban heat. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to think about um, the, how, how we're, 
how you can work with the whole property to reduce heat. Also the impacts of um, kind of, you know, what we're building for workers and the public, as well as people who are living in these buildings. So I think, you know, not just focusing on the infrastructure, but the people interacting with it. And then using natural infrastructure to reduce heat impacts by helping to preserve, restore, or manage, like whether we can incorporate into developments, particular kind of biodiversity gains as well as the, that also kind of help protect against extreme heat and and valuing these ecosystem services we're actually doing quite a lot of work on how we um, you know services uh, that are delivered to people have a value and how we can put a, a, a monetary value on that to kind of make sure that this value is captured in when we're looking at business case for example so that um, summarizes most of the report. I would like to say that it's not all my work and I was very lucky to work with around 65 other experts across the country who very much helped uh, kind of refine and develop the report. So thanks to them. I'd like to also stress so the, the several user-friendly digital features within the report. Um, so the action tables are actually clickable. So when you're in the report, you can click on the references, for example, here you can click and it will take you to the action the idea is that people can navigate around the report um, more easily rather than just having a printed copy i think we're kind of done with the printed copy uh, so much everyone's using things more online um, and there's also a fairly extensive reference list and i've tried to put headings so that when it's really easy to find additional reading on each of the actions that are mentioned uh, because obviously this is a summary of a lot of other people's work um, so um, there's a lot of other references where you can find out more details um, the report was released in april um, actually it snowed in montreal the day before we released this report um, so um, i was actually really happy that um, it was very well covered in the media uh, even though we at that time we were not in a heat wave or anything. So that was, you know, gratifying that the media is now covering climate solutions, not just the disasters, um, which is great. Um, and so there's a few links here. So it was featured, it's been featured on mainstream TV, radio coverage. Actually, we just did another 24 um, interviews last week, um, mainly because the uh, BC coroner just released their uh, detailed report. Um, so it's very much, uh, being paid attention to, which is great, um, as well as traditional written coverage in the Canadian press, Toronto Star, etc., uh, and on social media. Uh, Stephen Gilbo also commented on it, which was great. So, um, so it is getting attention, but what we need now is the action to go with the attention. So, and everyone has a role to play in that. Uh, just a reminder, it's one of many reports. So. Um, do if you have other interests do follow up on our website and key messages um, just to leave you with before we launch into our question session I think hopefully I have demonstrated we do need to adapt to extreme heat particularly in southern Canadian cities um, building designers have a key role to play both in like looking at buildings and communities uh, particularly um, the kind of blue green network of uh, natural infrastructure and there are many win-win opportunities both to reduce extreme heat, heat risk and basically make our lives better for example making our cities uh, better places to live that contribute to our well-being um, so that's it for my presentation i have kept to virtually 50 minutes um, so i'd like to just um, stop there and see if anyone has any questions or wants to take the discussion elsewhere that was wonderful thank you joanna uh, we do have some questions here. Um, I see we have one person with their hand raised, um, Gassan. Um, so I'm going to ask a question here um, first, and then Gassan, I will um, open up your mic after that, um, and, have, and then you can ask your question directly to Joanna. Uh, so a question coming in from Sumera: um, Our current schools are our current school buildings are not designed to combat this extreme heat. Um, what elements can we add to protect younger population from heat? 
Yeah, I think this is a key question, actually. That, um, so I know for, from, for example, my previous, uh, we have two schools on Nones Island. One has air conditioning and one newer school, the, the one older school doesn't have air conditioning at the moment at all uh, and was not designed for extreme heat. So I think, you know, there's, there's the actions that we can uh, focus on the building, but also the grounds are really um, really important for schools as well. So there's actually um, a fair few initiatives on greening school grounds and you can actually get subsidies and grants from people like Tree Canada um, and in certain cities specifically aimed at schools because um, they're very keen on kind of uh, planting trees and vegetating school grounds to the benefit of children, but also for to help with um, carbon um, carbon accounting as well. So um, I'd say there's kind of definitely built infrastructure actions. And I think maybe the, with the attention being given to ventilation as well from a COVID perspective, I see that very much kind of moving up the agenda of how we um, treat air quality. So hopefully thermal temperature of air as well, it will be part of that. So basically green and gray together, I think is the, is the message. Yeah, great. Um, it's certainly, uh, we were just talking about this recently, how uh, many of the new schools that have been built effectively followed the same um, design patterns of old schools um, with, you know, mostly concrete walls or, you know, not as much insulation as you would expect and um, not a lot of natural ventilation or because they're compartmentalized by their very nature of design, uh, they don't allow for much of that. Um, so certainly I think uh, it seems uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has certainly improved ventilation considerations. Um, so yeah, great comments, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Gassan, there I've opened up your mic, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, um, okay. I'll, okay, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free. I'm going to, um, we'll give you a second, but I'm going to ask another question in the meantime. Oh, I see you've written, <laughs> you've written the question and, oh, you, I see, you did not raise your hand. So, well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay, well, we have some other questions we can go to. So, um, we have a uh, question from Alex, um, who says, uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, many of the physical changes to buildings um, exterior shading, exterior insulation, some of the landscape changes, for example, uh, bring building owners into conflict with zoning bylaws in urban areas, precisely where we need these changes, as you have emphasized. City bylaws are notoriously difficult for individuals to work through. Uh, have you seen any city level action to change bylaws to enable such adaptations to extreme heat? Yeah, so there's, there was a couple of examples of cities that have specific uh, green or white roof uh, bylaws that are in place for roofs of a certain size or above. Uh, so that's in Toronto, there's, a, there's an example in Gouzmont in, in Montreal and Gatineau as well, I, I believe. So um, Gatineau also passed uh, bylaws looking at parking. Um, so there are examples where cities are starting to pass laws on kind of heat uh, reduct like e urban heat island reduction actions, um, but I, I do take your point that um, you know some of some of the bylaws or kind of some people are not able to put the actions that they put in want to put in place in place because of these restrictions. Um, and I think also the the national building code is kind of you know it's not fully been updated with climate change and climate adaptation in mind yet. Um, and I know, for example, the federal government uh, department that's working on that has a number of actions that they want kind of integrated into the code that has not really happened yet. So uh, we have a way to go in that respect. Okay, as a, as a sort of a follow up, I'm wondering uh, if you have any comment about um, the maybe it's a conflict just uh, as this is between the legislative or regulatory trend toward um, urban intensification um, and how that uh, will sort of you know work with this urban heat island um, in the absence I suppose of specific intent to reduce it. Yeah I think there's um... 
So there's definitely a very much a national conversation about densification and kind of limiting urban sprawl, for example. But I think, you know, we, we, we will need to plan this with uh, kind of natural assets in mind. And I think roofs are a, a key. I, I, I've, I've just recently traveled. And so you, you, when you fly across the city, you realize how much of the city is roof or parking. Um, so I think, you know, those are two elements that definitely we could do a lot better work with to kind of increase uh, how we're using vegetation and tree canopy um, to reduce the urban heat island effect while still having buildings in those places. Right. Yeah, so certainly, yeah, yeah good point. <laughs> certainly uh, green roofs uh, will help and, and white roofs, even cool roofs. Um, okay, let's go to uh, another question here um, from Raiden. The majority of people who died during BC's heat wave had multiple chronic illnesses. And throughout the presentation, you highlighted the importance of supporting vulnerable people. Were any vulnerable communities consulted in making this report? I'm thinking disability advocacy agent or organizations, indigenous organizations, tenancy agencies. So we, we worked with a number of agencies that work with those groups. So uh, for example, the Red Cross, um, uh, there was a, also a community, um, uh, like a grassroots um, organization called Crew that works specifically with vulnerable residents in Toronto in basically um, poor, but kind of lower lower income kind of uh, apartment blocks where people are often newly arrived immigrants or the, the English and French is not necessarily their first language. Uh, so working with these people who are uh, on the more vulnerable side. Um, like, for example, on projects like um, introducing resiliency roles of people on particular floors to look after their neighbors. Um, so yes, we did consult with um, with people who work with those 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 kind of um, disadvantaged groups. Yes, we did. Great. Um, so sort of on the same topic, one, one development we've been seeing a lot of um, in the affordable housing sector uh, and seniors housing, which both of which are, are um, there's a lot of funding for right now to address the housing shortage. Um, um, so the trend that we've been seeing there is uh, this, the designing of common spaces to act as um, emergency shelter in place. And as you said, cool rooms and things like that. Um, and I, I think of this as kind of a technical solution. But what you were just saying there made me think of like maybe part of the challenges we're thinking of this in terms, uh, I mean, most of the people that I'm discussing with anyway, are thinking of it in terms of a, a technical problem that needs a technical solution. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about this, um, like you just described, where, where maybe it's not a technical solution that needs to be there. Um, yeah, one of the concerns on I have about, um, so we, we, we do talk a lot about cool rooms and the kind of cool space network. The problem that we have is the people that we need to get to those rooms might not want to leave their house and they, they, they might be socially isolated because they don't want to go out. Um, so it's, um, it's a challenge, a, a social challenge because we do have people who are socially isolated and um, you know it's not part of their daily routine to see other people or want to go outside into like somewhere where they don't know with people they don't know. So I think it very much is a social uh, issue as well. And that, uh, you know, we all have a role to play in reaching out to those people um, that we do actually know who are in that situation. Um, but also the emergency services. I know in, in Montreal, as part of the emergency heat plan, the emergency services are pre-identified where uh, vulnerable people are living so that they can go and during a heat wave and check on those people specifically. Uh, but I think it's very, it's not just a technical solution, it's very much about behavior as well. Yeah, okay, thanks. All right, another question here from Nagin. Um, hello and thank you for your presentation. I was wondering what could be done to help residents of rentals in Toronto? As the rent safe uh, rent safe to to I see rent safe to does not include rental companies and most of them are occupied with vulnerable people and suffer from the heat in summer. Yeah, I think this is an area where we probably need further regulation to put 
responsibilities on landlords in to in terms of heat this is one of the things that i'm considering at the moment with the national adaptation strategy or the actions i would propose to to kind of create these responsibilities of for landlords uh, because you know we we have certain minimum temperatures for heating but we don't have maximum temperatures for when things are too hot um, so I think, you know, this is probably somewhere we will see um, regulation coming in because, yes, people who are renting do not have the same power of adapting as those who own their own property. Definitely. Yeah, that, it really is a, a challenge. Interesting. Um, okay, another question oh, from Kassan. Um, Extreme heat in Canada is above 30 degrees. Um, in the Middle East now, it is above 50 degrees for many days in the summer. Um, how much is the extreme heat in the United States and why is just 30 degrees in Canada considered extreme heat? Yeah, this is a great question. So it's not actually, so heat alerts in Canada are not a blanket 30 degrees, right? So if you actually look, um, so in the appendix of the report, there's all the thresholds of heat alerts and they actually vary between provinces because acclimatization is an extremely important factor uh, when it comes to how we physiologically react to extreme heat and what can adversely affect us. So when we are used to hot temperatures, um, we are not as sensitive when it's hot. Um, so this is why as well, um, it can be particularly problematic when we have heat waves early in the season. Uh, so for example, we had a heat, mini heat wave here in Montreal in May. Um, so when we have these early heat waves, it can actually be more problematic because we are not ready for that. Our bodies are not acclimatized for that. Um, and but through the summer, we become more acclimatized um, slightly. So, um, so when we are like regularly experiencing hot temperatures like in the Middle East, then it takes a greater temperature to get, like to make us have a physiological response. So acclimatization is very much a part of the heat threshold setting. And I know actually that in Quebec, our heat alert system basically takes into account kind of when, where we are in the season and what the preceding temperatures have been. So the public health system kind of take, tries to take into account those factors also. So, uh, so it's not the same everywhere and it like you know an extreme high temperature in the north of Canada is very much lower than it is in the south of Canada as well so it depends what our what our normal normal zone is or our new normal kind of experiences that makes a lot of sense thanks for that answer um okay so we have um any more questions coming in? Um, I have some some email questions that came in earlier. Um, again, if anyone would like to ask a question directly to Joanna, um, just you can just put up your hand, um, your virtual hand, and we can ask directly. Um, so I have a few here, and I'm, I'm going to just sort of um, pick one about smaller cities. So most of what you, you focused on, and you you noted that you know bigger cities are where most of the urban heat island effect is. It's where the greatest population is, so the, the greatest effects are felt. Um, what is there, or have you, did you find anything that maybe smaller cities can do while, as they're developing? Because that's what we're seeing a lot of smaller cities starting to grow and, um, you know, grow more rapidly and more intensively in, in densification. Um, is there any policies or um, any recommendations that you would have for planners in smaller cities on how to develop in a way that will reduce this effect? Yeah, I think uh, really valuing natural assets and how we integrate both built environment with natural environment is exceedingly important. Uh, like we're, we're now in many of our cities trying to increase tree canopy because we've realized that we don't have enough vegetation uh, as part of our city. So I guess that's one of the luxuries for people, people who are developing is that they can make sure that they protect and make room for kind of you know cool corridors or like active transport routes that have uh, rivers and trees and you know so that we're making space for nature and for the services that nature offers us that we're valuing them um so that's one key thing i think um the other thing is to, to think of is kind of you know how i think we're at the point where now we're much 
more thinking about public transport and you know, active transport and densification is very much about kind of, you know, shopping locally and making things accessible so people don't need to use the car. And that's definitely a, a different paradigm than when many of our larger cities were, were developed. Um, so that, you know, people don't need to, to get out and into their car and drive and we don't need so much road and parking space. I, I think parking space is another one where I see in Canada, we have very, a lot of surface parking rather than kind of underground parking or multi-story parking. Like I, I'm from Europe, so I'm very used to seeing underground parking. You go down God knows how many floors and you're still parking down there or you're parking up on the roof. Um, so, you know, we, we have a lot of same level parking in Canada. So maybe that's a good opportunity also. Right, that is the, yeah, that is a, a huge opportunity for um, change in Canada. Um, we often talk about it from a, as a site for solar energy um, and then LID as well, you know, trying to naturalize those spaces a little bit. Um, but yeah, you're right. We do have a lot of level parking. Um, okay, we have a, a question here from Stacy. Um, has Indigenous people experienced the brunt of climate impacts were Indigenous perspectives uh, on either their extreme heat risks or solutions to the problem included in the report? Uh, so we did not consult directly with uh, Indigenous people um, on this report, and that is a stage that we've identified actually would add to this. Um, so we, we did consult in like with health organizations that then con consult with Indigenous groups. So, but we haven't got a kind of Indigenous specific um, set of guidelines. And I think that's something that could be done further leading on this to really kind of target some of the recommendations to the Indigenous re reality. Because, you know, we, we haven't tackled, you know, um, how, you to, how to reduce extreme heat on reserve lands, for example, where, you know, often the housing situation is not the same as it is in our more kind of urban cities. Uh, so we know we haven't we haven't done that yet, um, but we did consult with people, as I said, like with, like with Red Cross, who do consult with those people. So it's like kind of secondhand information, but it definitely would be an advantage to do more work in that area. Certainly, um, great observation. Uh, so um, I'm just pulling up my notes now, and I know I made a couple of notes about uh, from the report. Um, you, there's a lot about, uh, there's a little section about passive cooling for buildings. Um, and I, I'm interested in the, the overlap of energy efficiency and um, sort of thermal uh, sort of regulation, I guess. You know, a lot of what we do in the sort of advanced high performance buildings is, you know, there's a lot of air tightness attention to, um, you know, insulation, insulating parts of the buildings that are typically left alone. And I, I noticed that that was in the report and I wondered if you had any comments um, about if there are any specific building types um, maybe that you had found during this research um, where uh, this was particularly problematic. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of the, there's, there's definite win-win for energy efficiency and extreme heat. And I think one of the areas that we focused or pulled out of for action potentially is like making extreme heat or resilience basically part of the Energuide assessment. So, and this is actually something that the federal government um, said that they would do in advance of, of the previous elections. So um, the idea would be that there would be a resilience assessment of which extreme heat would be one of the things that they look at. Um, at the same time as energy efficiency. And that would help identify some of these win-win actions, particularly for extreme heat that help, like insulation would help with energy efficiency for heating, energy efficiency for cooling, and it would make the, cool, the house cooler, even if you weren't using active cooling. So, um, so I think there's definitely overlaps. And I think, but I think in terms of buildings, what we're, we've, we're really kind of focused on as a worry area is multi-unit residential buildings that are of poor quality where people have, you know, really limited ways of trying to make their, their own apartment cooler. 
um, and you know are, are also vulnerable in times of power outage as well. So those kind of building types, I think, are where we need to also specifically focus in terms of regulation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I see there, Gassan um, has asked another question. I just asked if, if you'd like to ask directly. Um, if so, I can open up your mic or I can just ask the question for you. I, hold on one second. I'm going to try to open up your mic here. There, if you'd like to go ahead, you should be able to open your mic now and, and comment. Or if not, I will just go ahead and ask for you. OK. Um, so Gassan writes, uh, we, the humans, can, can manage extreme heat by modifying our built environment. However, the wildlife cannot. And because of the increase in heat, Canada is um, more than two times. Um, oh, there's a, I, we cannot hear your voice right now, Gassan. You should have a button there at the top right with a picture of a microphone. If you click on that, should unmute. No, still not working. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll continue. Um, so wildlife cannot um, obviously modify their environment, the built environment, to the extent that we can. Um, and because of the increase in Canada, Canada is more than two times of other parts of the world. Um, what would be the future of wildlife in Canada with new extreme heat waves? So what we're seeing in terms of Canada, uh, so obviously extreme heat events are obviously likely to be problematic for large kills of fish, self shellfish, uh, potentially when it's linked to drought as well, vegetation will suffer. And often we see kind of extreme heat and drought and wildfires. So often extreme heat is linked to other problems. Um, but in terms of kind of nature's reaction to the temperature increase is going to be to migrate northwards where it's cooler because uh, nature will will adapt. Um, so that what we're seeing will be kind of succession of kind of shift in biomes towards the north. Um, and we can all, already see some some shifting going on. Um, so that will, you know, on the general in temperature, but, you know, extreme heat events will be problematic for certain species as well on top of that. So, but I think the, you know, the, when, when we talk about nature, I think nature actually, it's actively adapting all the time, right? It's adapting to, to kind of all the kind of prevailing temperatures and uh, the amounts of water and kind of that that kind of thing whereas we actually value the status quo and we see we have quite a lot of inertia um as a human race like we can adapt to our built environments but we're not necessarily doing it fast enough so um i think you know we we may see the like humans can adapt but are they going to adapt in time to to and before the next disaster um uh, you know Sometimes I feel like we're just jumping between disasters and we haven't actually made that much change by the time we get to the next problem. Yeah, that is a very good point. Um, so, so Gassan, we see your mic is open now. If you had any further comments, please feel free. Um, but to that, to the point about uh, wildlife, uh, the one thing that I have noticed a lot uh, in the last year or two is uh, ticks. Um, they are expanding northward, and they do not die off in the winter nearly as much as they have. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, you know the the ash borer uh, beetle is ravaging the uh, forests in Canada right now. Um, I know um, at, at where I live, we are seeing you know. Uh, whole forests um, decimated and all of the ash trees are um, killed off in just one or two years. Yeah, that's a great point. So, so some, uh, some creatures are finding it really an advantage that it's warmer. Um, mosquitoes also like different. I know um, so my, my family is in some of my family is in the south of France and they have new mosquitoes. They have like tiger mosquitoes that are particularly aggressive um, that they didn't oh. have before. 
uh, because of the higher temperatures. So um, yeah, we are seeing species that thrive in higher temperatures moving into our country also. Certainly. Uh, and, and plants too, I would imagine, um, slightly slower, but yeah, certainly. Um, okay, we have one other question about, I, I, this might be a little too technical, but um, so uh, heat pumps and, and geo exchange um, systems are increasingly popular um, systems for replacing existing heating and cooling systems, uh, but they generally work by taking the heat out of a building and then dumping it in the environment around. Um, with geo exchange, um, you know, an individual system may not have a big impact, but I'm wondering if you came across any impacts from you know, the, the, what would happen with the large scale implementation of these types of systems? Would they increase heat island effect? Would they be less than what is already there? Well, I think that's our concern that if, if we just jump into everybody applying active cooling measures, like A, we will be using more energy, potentially burning like more greenhouse gas, more greenhouse gas emissions associated if it's not clean energy. And then yes, the, the, the byproduct is more hot air, which effectively makes the urban heat island effect worse. Um, so that's why we're so keen on, why well, we keep the active cooling measures because obviously they have a part to play, but it's really important that we balance that with passive cooling measures because we can't just go and just rely on, um, uh, on active cooling, like in air conditioning. So, um, and I think the, the, other, the other thing I would say is that we're becoming more vulnerable if we are only rec rec um, reliant on electricity, because if the electricity then goes out, then all of those measures that are, if we're just reliant on active measures, then we won't have them. Um, so we need to be really working with the green infrastructure and the passive cooling measures at the same time, and making sure that we are doing additional things than just buying air conditioning. Right. Um, okay, so then my other question that follows on that is then um, one note uh, that you mentioned earlier uh, and is in the report is that how the built environment um, contributes to the to extreme heat events. And is there, I'm, I'm thinking for the, the structural engineers and the architects, is there anything that could be done to, uh, to the existing buildings that um, would reduce the exterior heat? I mean, mostly as designers, we're thinking about, you know, the interior heat. So if we can, you know, put something on a building that shades the building itself, um, that that helps cool that building in particular and the people within it. Um, but does it have an impact on urban heat island, or is it just at a building level? So the things like the looking at the albedo, which is the reflectivity of the building, like the colors that we use for a building, the types of cladding that can help to reflect the energy back up so that we don't absorb so much of the heat uh, and also vegetated buildings. So the, the green roofs and the, the green facades we have, or the green walls are not as common as they could be. I think they've been around for a while now, um, but they, they haven't really kind of taken off yet um, or you know, in, they're very much more innovative and not mainstream. So I think, you know, vegetated walls and, and roofs also can actually help us manage water. Like um, there's actually, um, you know, the blue roofs, for example, that um, are being actively used to manage storm water. So those particular measures can, can help with the heat and with the, the kind of urban flooding as well. So yeah, to consider. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at the time, I've got about 2.20. I think um, I don't see any more questions coming in and I, I think we should start wrapping up now. Um, and so I'll just ask uh, finally, the last question for you, Joanna, is is there anything anything that um, is not in the report that you would that you think that our audience, our members, um, uh, architects and engineers and designers and planners and um, you know regulators, do you think there's anything that they should know or seek out that would help complement um, your report? So I would encourage people to look at the National Adaptation Strategy page, actually. So, um, so at the moment, Canada is developing a national adaptation strategy, including, you know, how we react to extreme heat, also flooding and fire. 
and we're actually right in the middle of the consult uh, consultation period. So um, all comments are being accepted from all kinds of different organizations. So it's a chance to contribute to that conversation. Um, and, you know, we're really hoping that the, ex the, the strategy that comes out of this, which will be developed and produced by COP27, so by the end of the year, we will have a national strategy. So um, now is the time to make your voice heard, basically. So um, I think that if you go to lextalkadaptation.ca, um, you can contribute to that discussion. Amazing. That's a great advice. So letstalkadaptation.ca. OK, so everybody go there. Um, and then everybody go to the link here, the Intact Center Climate for Climate Adaptation. Um, and I actually will send out the report. So um, we will send out the recording of this session, the report and um, Joanna's presentation um, as a link to everyone um, tomorrow. Um, so you get all of that in an email link. Um, so you can go back and review this whole presentation, go through the report um, if you have not already. Um, it really is uh, incredible research and really, um, it really is the first thing on this topic, and it's really, really helping. Um, and then say hi to Joanna's cat. <laughs> it's always nice to have a cat. Um, I asked her to come just at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> just in time for a, a copy. Um, so I, again, Joanna, thank you so much. This was a, an incredible presentation, and really, um, I am grateful for the work you have put into this report and for you um, giving your time to us today. Um, to present this. Um, it's really quite wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and to everyone for listening. And uh, yeah, we, we do this work so that it gets used. So please do take advantage. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, with that, we will sign off and say thank you to everyone, um, our audience today. If you have any further questions, you can feel free to reach out to me or Joanna at any time. Uh, you, you will receive our contact information as well uh, with the email package. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye.